I think you'll certainly find that uh, the way in which the discourse has moved around the world on things like homosexual rights, on things like um, other privileges for same-sex couples, transgenders, all of this... Not moving very bit... fast in India, your own country, I should say. Well, transgenders, curiously, is moving faster than same-sex relationships mm. uh, in terms of political acceptability, mm. simply because culturally we've simply been used to them being around all this time. Uh, homosexuality, frankly, was completely acceptable in Indian culture for, for 2,000 years till the Brits came along and uh, yeah. and outlawed it. Yeah. And India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer. Went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately as a matter of written minuted policy proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, Churchill's conduct in 43, simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. <laughs> The Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors, guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk, Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottawa who mentioned uh, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. <laughs> let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. <laughs> we... <laughs> we were denied democracy, sir. We had to snatch it, seize it from you. With the greatest of reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule and that too with limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. I think only if there's real give and take in a negotiation. It's just not going to happen automatically, and certainly not because of any nostalgia for empire, John. Really? I mean, surely we have a special relationship, as Mr. Trump would put it. If you keep losing to us at cricket, we probably will consider that a good special relationship worth maintaining. But no jokes apart, I think there are obvious affinities which will continue and which are there, but they're not enough. Uh, trade negotiations are hard-headed, realistic business propositions, and there will have to be some give. Far more important is the moral case. I think what really matters is for Britain to look within and to recognize there's something to be apologetic about. Uh, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, apologized last year on the centenary of an incident in which a ship laden with Indian refugees fleeing the British was turned away from Vancouver, uh, Vancouver port and pretty much everybody on board came to a grisly end, either on the high seas or subsequently at British hands. And Trudeau, even though the Canadians didn't actually kill anybody themselves, and even though that was also 100 years ago, did apologize. T to my mind, I think just, just 
taking collective responsibility is a moral step that the British have simply not contemplated after 200 years of profiting from their empire. And I think it's, I think it's sad. We just celebrated the centenary or commemorated the centenary of the First World War in these last few years. It's still going on, really, till 2018. Do you know that an, a million Indians fought under arms for the British side? Do you know it was largely Indian soldiers that stopped the German advance at Ypres at the beginning of the war? Do you know that India supplied pack animals, food, clothing, rations, even rail lines ripped out of the ground in India and sent off to aid the war effort, and that the total contribution of Indians in, 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 in cash and kind is estimated in today's money at about 80 billion pounds sterling? I'm quite sure you don't know that because the British don't tell you that. It's a great triumph for British arms, but India has been forgotten. I drove past a statue in London to animals that participated in the war. There is no statue to the Indians. Competition. Okay. But I asked myself, why should I want to compete with China? As long as my people are not starving, they can have three meals a day, decent work, better quality of life. Let the Chinese people have it too. We're not in a race against each other. We're in a race for the same things. I have spoken to so many African heads of state and government and foreign ministers in the last 10 or 15 years. They admire China. They're grateful to China for the generosity of Chinese aid. But they do not think the Chinese model is replicable in their societies. They look on it as something in many ways impressive and awe-inspiring, but utterly foreign to but them. Not for they them. cannot be China. They cannot try to be like China. They look at India and they say, now there's a mess just like us. They have the same <laughs> sorts of problems. They have the poverty. They have the, uh, uh, the divisions. We may have clans. They may have castes. If they can triumph over these problems, we can learn from them. Uh -huh. This is the message I'm getting. They don't believe they can learn from China. I don't agree with Martin. You're a I, I, 